an update on how the court is using technology and the impact of key issues facing the federal circuit. This panel is an hour and a half. Welcome to the Judicial Conference of the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. At the instance of the Congress, all circuit courts are to hold such conferences from time to time. This is our first conference since 2002 when we celebrated the court's 20th anniversary. Now as the court approaches the quarter century mark, it is time once again to assess where we are and where we are headed. But first, I would like to note the passing of former Chief Judge Howard T. Markey, who died on May 3rd. He was our first chief, and he launched our court very well. I would add that he was loved by judges and staff who knew him and will be missed by us all. On May 9th, I had the honor of speaking at his funeral service in Chicago, and on the 15th of May, of writing about him for the Legal Times. More importantly, on the 23rd of June at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, Judge Markey will be buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery, and all are welcome there. We will post the details on our website to inform the court family and the members of our bar. A few trends particularly catch my eye as I follow the work of the court. The most significant is that Patent cases have replaced personnel cases as our most numerous. In the mid-90s, the personnel cases made up about 50% of our caseload. And the patent cases at that point were only 20%. Now they're both at about 33%. And of course, that represents a bit of a shift in workload because by and large, the patent cases are more complex and more time consuming than the cases from the Merit System Protection Board. As of uh, April 30th of this year, just by way of illustration, we had pending before us 392 patent infringement cases and only 213 cases from the board. In between those two figures at 333 was the pending case load from the Veterans Court of Appeals. So again, uh, a shift from prior years. The uh, net effect of these changes, as I suggest, is that the workload for our 12 active judges uh, has gone up considerably, certainly since I first joined the court myself in 1988. We have a lot more patent cases. They're a lot more complicated. They take a lot more time. Many of them are close. Many have multiple difficult issues, and yet we have the same 12 judges to perform this work. Consequently, our judges are hard pressed to maintain the same speed now and the same quality now as in the past. In the materials uh, provided to you at the start of the conference is a one-page summary that gives some further details on the uh, caseload and filing numbers. Uh, with the rising workload, we're particularly challenged now because as many of you know, Judge Raymond C. Clevenger III took senior status at the beginning of February. So we're now operating not with 12, but with 11 active judges. Fortunately, yesterday, the president nominated a replacement for Judge uh, Clevenger, namely Professor Kimberly Moore. Well, no one can predict um, the future of the confirmation process, but likely uh, it will be months before she could be confirmed and assume office. In the meantime, as always, we are much indebted to our now four senior judges who help us uh, greatly to maintain uh, a current status with our caseload. We remain one of the very fastest of all 13 circuits, but with the trends that I've mentioned, uh, our speed has slipped uh, a little bit in the last six or seven months, so we'll be very happy to have uh, 12 judges once again. Also relevant to our workload are uh, occasional 
thoughts in the Congress to significantly expand our jurisdiction. Uh, last year, the Congress considered doing so with regard to asbestos cases, and as many of you no doubt noted, uh, more recently uh, made a similar suggestion with respect to immigration appeals. Uh, it would have been uh, quite a daunting task uh, because there are, are 13,000 such appeals a year. We only get about 1,600 filings, so we, it would be an extraordinary increase and it would require vast increases in staff, space, budget, and other facilities. Fortunately, the uh, threat seems to have greatly receded. The bill being debated this week and expected to be passed perhaps next week by the Senate um, omits this jurisdictional uh, shift. I, I myself uh, testified along with uh, four other judges on April 3rd, pointing out to the Senate Judiciary Committee the uh, huge consequences that such a shift would have. And the Congress, uh, particularly that committee, seemed to be quite eager to hear from all the judges who had anything to add and also seemed receptive to the timely intervention in written form by leaders of the American Intellectual Property Law Association, the American Bar Association section on intellectual property, the intellectual property owners, and also the Federal Circuit Bar Association. Now, I just want to emphasize that since in the main uh, judges are not allowed to lobby Congress, we're quite dependent on each of you here in this room and the various organizations to which you belong, so we appreciate your work. Another feature of our uh, recent uh, experiences is that the Supreme Court uh, has shown a suddenly greatly increased interest in our work, particularly in patent cases. They've already uh, decided by my recollection uh, three, including one just this past Monday dealing with injunctions. Uh, there are uh, two or three more that are uh, underway and there are uh, three more yet in which the Solicitor General has been asked to opine as to the possible grant of cert, so it's a, it's a banner year. I won't uh, go into the details of those various cases. Uh, they're quite familiar to those of you here who follow the patent law, but they are uh, quite significant. At the level of our own in-bank work, we currently have pending uh, one case uh, in in-bank sta status, namely Kirkendall versus Department of the Army. It involves a disabled veteran's claim of unemployment, uh, pardon me, of employment discrimination and violation of his veteran's preference rights. Uh, the case will require us to consider as well whether under the Veterans Employment Opportunities Act of 1998, the time period for filing claims and appealing them to the Merit System Protection Board may ever be equitably told. There are some other issues in that case. I won't go into the details now, but I do uh, want to note that uh, this veteran is being represented on a pro bono basis by former Solicitor General Theodore Olson at the request of the court in a new program for appointing counsel in selected pro se cases. We will need more volunteers from time to time and we may turn to many of the men and women uh, here in this room, so we hope you will, you will consider it. Of course, if the Kirkendall uh, case uh, is argued, the argument will take place in our new ceremonial courtroom renovated last year, courtroom 201. I hope most of you have seen it. It's really quite grand. We uh, expect this summer to begin a similar renovation of the courtroom on the fourth floor, the old CCPA courtroom, which we now designate as courtroom 402. That courtroom will have the same traditional appearance as the main courtroom and will also incorporate the same state-of-the-art technology, particularly video conferencing equipment, which would allow for the possibility of judges hearing oral argument where the attorneys are speaking from remote sites in other cities around the country. In addition, the seating capacity will be uh, doubled and various other improvements, uh, including wheelchair access, will be provided. We hope that 402 will be completed uh, within a year. Already, we are digitally recording the audio portion of oral arguments, regardless of which courtroom uh, they're held in. And the arguments in MP3 format are made available on our website within a few hours of being given. I know many of you are aware of that, but those who aren't might uh, want to listen. It's, uh, it's become a popular sport here in Washington. Many people have commented to me about how much they like being able to hear the arguments. 
Another uh, aspect of our regular activities uh, every year is to uh, hold arguments uh, out of Washington. We've done that on pretty much an annual basis for, uh, for two decades. Since the last conference uh, in 2002, the court has held uh, arguments in Boston, Cleveland, Los Angeles, and last November in Chicago. This coming October, we plan to sit in Charlottesville and Richmond where we will hear arguments at the law schools of the University of Virginia and the University of Richmond and also at the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit uh, Courthouse. Uh, in addition, uh, in connection with our stay in Charlottesville, there's likely to be an interesting continuing legal education uh, sponsored by the Federal Circuit Bar Association in conjunction with the court and uh, also a very elegant dinner uh, the same evening in the university's historic rotunda building under the sponsorship of the university and the Federal Circuit Bar Association. I'm going to uh, shortly call on my esteemed colleague, uh, Judge Richard Lynn, uh, who uh, will speak uh, in a summary fashion about some of the developments concerning information technology. We are undertaking major enhancements and I appointed a task force um, of, of four judges uh, headed by Judge Lynn, um, and they've been doing some marvelous work. The oral arguments on the website are only one of the many uh, enhancements. Others will become more visible as uh, time goes on. Uh, after Judge Lynn, Judge Shaw will speak briefly. He too uh, accepted my request that he serve as the head of a task force of, in this case, three judges to work on the mediation program, which grew out of a session uh, retreat we had in April of 2005 uh, with our advisory committee and many of the uh, uh, key leaders of the bar. This is another major initiative, and it's intended to meet the squeeze we're in where we have more cases and bigger cases, but the same number of judges. This is one of the methods that we uh, hope uh, will uh, allow us to stay current and stay careful. And finally, uh, Circuit Executive Jan Horvely will give a brief update on uh, changes to the Federal Circuit rules. Before recognizing Judge Lynn, however, I would like to acknowledge the presence of some two dozen district judges from all around the country who've come to be part of our conference. Uh, we will be uh, meeting with them in a judges only session uh, during uh, the latter part of the afternoon when those of you will here will be in breakout sessions, and this will sort of be the counterpart to our meeting with the administrative judges uh, in connection with the retreat that I mentioned uh, earlier. In addition, we have almost 100 judges of various administrative uh, tribunals that we review here in attendance. I welcome them as well. Since we are a, a national court and one with varied jurisdiction, it is most fitting to have all these uh, adjudicators and judicial colleagues with us, and I thank them all for coming. Finally, I would like to express my appreciation for the 16 members of the Federal Circuit Advisory Council. They have been doing double duty as the steering committee planning this conference as well as giving advice on mediation and other topics. I thank them all for their very hard work on all these issues and particularly the ABLE co-chairs Scott McCaleb and Mike Sheingold. I also want to thank the 13 pro bono mediators who have signed up and trained and are ready to assist our court. Many of them are here today. The bios of these highly experienced uh, volunteer mediation attorneys are posted on our website, and, and when you look at them, uh, you'll, you'll see that a case would be very well entrusted into their hands. I hope you will utilize their services, which of course are free. I also want, of course, uh, in closing, to acknowledge the very uh, hard work of our entire staff who have organized this conference. Judge Lynn. Thank you, Chief. Good morning. Uh, about a year ago, Chief Judge Michelle, recognizing the increasing importance of information technology to the operation of the court, formed an, an information technology task force. As he mentioned, he asked me to serve along with Judges Clevenger, Rader, and Prost. Our charge was simply to provide guidance and leadership in the IT area and specifically to look at ways in which the court can better use IT 
to assist the court and the judges in carrying out our responsibilities and to inform the public of the work of the court and the status of the cases before us. Since the task force has been in existence, a number of changes have taken place under the direction of the head of our IT group, Larry Llewellyn, and his excellent staff. The court IT infrastructure has been upgraded to meet anticipated new demands, and the judges have been provided with BlackBerry devices, laptops, and upgraded desktop computers. Uh, the court has upgraded and expanded its website. As you probably know, for some time now, all precedential and non-precedential opinions have been posted on the website as they are released. We have upgraded our recording capabilities and are now recording all oral arguments digitally. About a month ago, we began posting those oral arguments on our website in downloadable MP3 format. Uh, the arguments can be searched by caption, by date, or case number. In the first week, we received nearly 6,000 hits from parties desiring to list, listen to the posted recordings. And in the one month that this feature has been available, the number of hits has grown to more than 36,000 from 50 countries around the world with almost 5,000 downloads. Uh, the popularity of this feature is a clear reflection of the public interest and indicates the importance of IT and the court's ability to serve that interest. The court is also considering a rule change to implement the electronic filing of both briefs and appendices in cases where the parties are represented by counsel. The digital version, versions would be required in addition to the paper copies now required by the federal rules. In considering this change, the task force canvassed the practices of the regional circuits and drafted a series of proposed rule changes to adopt the best practices of all of the regional circuits and to implement some additional features to best serve the interests of our court. The proposed rule changes are presently under active consideration by the court. And if these rule changes are adopted, the digital versions of the briefs and appendices, like the digital recordings of the oral arguments, will be made available to the public over the internet, most likely on PACER. I think this proposal is very important. Not only would it aid the judges in studying the briefs and in preparing for oral argument, but for the public, implementation of this proposed rule would make accessible to all interested persons via the court's website not only the briefs, but also the decision under review, the record relevant to the issues presented in the appeal and contained in the appendix, the oral argument, and ultimately the decision of the court. Uh, these are just some of the things the court is doing in the IT area. The court welcomes your input and I invite anyone with suggestions or ideas to share them through the clerk's office. Um, I'll now turn over the program to my colleague, Judge Shaw. Thank you, Judge Lynn. It was just about a a year ago, the Chief Judge Michelle approached me and asked me to chair a committee comprised of myself, Judge Gallarza, and Judge Dyke. The task of the committee, the Chief informed me, would be to uh, establish and manage a pilot appellate mediation program here at the Federal Circuit. In the very brief time that I have, I would like to do three things. One explain how our mediation program came about, something the chief touched on briefly. Two, tell you where we are now with the program. And three, give you some sense of what may be ahead. The Federal Circuit's uh, appellate mediation program came about <coughs> really for two reasons. First, <coughs> as of last year, we were the only federal appeals court without such a program. Second, the chief judge and the court saw the program 
as a means of encouraging settlement in cases that might not otherwise settle. Obviously, settlement is good for the court. As the chief mentioned, when a case settles, it means that judge time will not have to be spent deciding the case. And this is extremely important as both our caseload increases and our cases become more complex. <clears throat> Turning to where we are now in the, in the program, the <clears throat> appellate mediation program well, let me back up for a moment. Um, no, uh, no discussion of the history of the program would be complete without an expression of thanks to two organizations and three individuals in particular. First of all, I want to thank, on behalf of the court, the Federal Circuit Advisory Council, and in particular, uh, Scott, Sh Scott McCaleb, and Mike Shanegold for their tireless efforts in connection with assisting us in getting the appellate mediation program off the ground. I also want to express the thanks to the court to the Federal Circuit Bar Association and in particular its executive director Jim Brookshire. Jim and the, associa and the association have been invaluable in publicizing the mediation program and in helping recruit mediators for the program. That's really the history. Where does the program stand now? The mediation program was established officially by order of the court on August 1, 2005, and it commenced operation on October the 3rd, 2005. Both the court's order and the guidelines for the program are posted on our website. Since <coughs> October the 3rd of last year, Ed, Hos excuse me, Ed Hoskin is our circuit mediation officer, and he works closely with Ellie Thayer, the court's senior staff attorney. The court is indebted to both Ed and Ellie for their work in the program. I would just add, though, that of course the people who are in the trenches and work to get cases settled are our mediators. As the chief mentioned, we presently have an exceptional core of 13 mediators, nine of whom I understand are here today. <clears throat> we are always on the lookout, however, for additional mediators. The mediator application form, which spells out our requirements, is on the court's website. It is also on the Federal Circuit Bar Association's website, and I urge anyone who is interested to apply. Since October the 3rd of last year, 20 cases have entered the mediation program. Of those 20 cases, four have settled, eight have dropped out of the program, and eight remain in the program in mediation. You may be interested to know that the four cases that have officially settled were from the Trademark Trial and Appeals Board, the Interior Board of Contract Appeals, a United States District Court, and the Court of Federal Claims. Looking ahead, currently the Court's Mediation Committee is reviewing the program and the experience with we have had with it since it began operation. Based upon that review, recommendations will be made to the Court for changes in the program. Those changes will be reflected in amendments to the guidelines that we have. So far, we have received suggestions and thoughts from our mediation staff, Ed Hoskin and Ellie Thayer, from judges, from mediators, and from members of the bar. I would just like to take this opportunity to encourage each of you in the audience, whether you are a judge, an attorney in private practice, or an attorney in government service, to give us your comments and suggestions concerning the program. Tell us what you think we're doing right, and tell us how you think the program could be improved. You can email any and all comments and suggestions you may have to Ed Hoskin. I will just conclude by saying briefly that the court looks forward to working with the bar to make the mediation program grow and become an effective vehicle for saving time and money and for disposing of cases. 
With that, I will turn the floor over to Jan Horbley, our circuit executive, who will speak about rules changes. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Shaw. Good morning. On behalf of the court staff, the members of the clerk's office, and the court as a whole, I extend to all of you a warm welcome to Washington, D.C., to the uh, Grand Hyatt Washington Hotel, and to this, the Federal Circuit uh, uh, Judicial Conference for 2006. We are pleased to have you here, and uh, whether you've come from a long way or a short distance or across the street, uh, we're pleased to see you here. Of course, uh, some of you are required to be here and we're happy to see you too. <laughs> In the short time I have with you this morning, I'd like to give you an update on some recent changes to the court's uh, rules of practice, and also to give you some information on uh, <clears throat> conference material that may be helpful to you today. The update information on the uh, court's rules of practice should be helpful to you in your practice before the court, and the conference information should make your life here easier while you're at the uh, conference. When you stopped at the registration booth this morning, each of you should have received a packet of the court's rules in your uh, materials. The new copy of the rules is uh, dated May 1st, 2006, and it contains all of the recent changes that have occurred since the last printing, which is in uh, May of 2002. The recent uh, changes in the court's rule of practice are highlighted and summarized inside the front cover. I'll give you a quick snapshot of all the developments that have occurred there. These changes deal with word counts, unopposed motions for extensions of time, statements of finality and judgments, and uh, new fees for attorney admissions and filing fees. On page Roman numeral five of the court's rules, the current list of the members of the court's uh, advisory council are there. The advisory council plays an important role in the operation and administration of the court and really serves as a liaison uh, between the bar and the court. Uh, the advisory council members are, uh, that are listed are the ones that you probably want to contact if you have thoughts on how the court's rules of practice can be improved and if you have uh, thoughts and ideas on how the practice before the court uh, can be changed. An additional duty for the advisory council uh, was to plan the program for today's conference. At page Roman numeral seven is a list of the court's uh, mediators that Judge Shaw referred to. Many of those mediators are here, and uh, as Judge Shaw mentioned, they've been uh, very uh, instrumental in settling a number of cases before this court. The most important change to the court's rules of practice is the addition of the new CD-ROM in the back of the rules. This CD-ROM is different from the CD-ROM in the 2002 version of the court's rules of practice. It's different because this CD-ROM has hyperlinks to sources cited in the rules. For example, there is a reference in Federal Circuit Rule 1 to Section 2461 of Title 7 of the United States Code. In the CD-ROM, there is a hyperlink to Section 2462 of Title 7 of the United States Code. With the hyperlink, there's no need to look up the statute or the section, but it instantly will appear on the screen. Citation to other Federal Circuit rules of practice also are hyperlinked, as are references to forms in the rules of practice. Where it says C Form 6, you'll be able to hyperlink to Rule 6, to Form 6. Where it says C Form or Rule 56B, you'll be able to hyperlink to 56B. Using this CD-ROM on your personal computer or installing it on your firm's uh, network should make it easier for you to use the court's rules and to access forms, statutes, and cases cited in the rules. In addition, you can fill out forms in the rules and uh, print them out immediately. Another helpful feature in the rules of practice is the list of telephone numbers printed on the inside of the back cover. These telephone numbers are for particular sections in the clerk's office. Using these telephone numbers will help you to obtain information quickly when you call the clerk's office. If you have a question, for example, about oral arguments or oral argument schedules, 
there is a telephone number for you to call. If you have questions about particular cases, Merit System Protection Board cases, United States Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims cases, Court of Federal Claims cases, or district court cases, there are telephone numbers for someone to speak to someone who has expertise in that particular area. Also, if you have questions about special types of actions before the court, petitions for rehearings, for example, there's a telephone number for you to call. On whole, this is an exciting copy of the court's rules of practice. I hope you find the new rules helpful, and I know people uh, in the clerk's office will be interested in your reaction to the uh, hyperlink feature in the rules of practice. So far as I know, we are the only circuit court of appeals in the nation that has not only a CD-ROM for the rules, but uh, hyperlinks to boot. The second matter I'd like to address uh, involves some uh, administrative matters associated with the conference. Uh, Pam Twyford, our, our conference coordinator, and her staff have done an outstanding job in handling the logistics of this conference. She is assisted today by uh, approximately 40 members of the court staff, all of whom are wearing green or yellow uh, ribbons on their badges. If you need help during the conference, see them for assistance. As you may know, the conference hall here is five floors below street level. That means your cell phones do not work here. It also means that you cannot call out from here on your cell phone. If you need to make a call on your phone, you'll have to go up the escalator to the next floor uh, or use the pay phones that are just around the corner from the registration desk. If you're waiting for an important call, messages can be left at the conference registration desk. The telephone number at the conference registration desk is 202-637-8004. I'll repeat that number, 202-637-8004. If any messages come in, they'll be posted on a message board there at the registration desk and you can pick them up there. This concludes my update on the court's rules of practice and my administrative announcements. I'm followed this morning by the panel addressing the topic, the Federal Circuit looking ahead, the most important issues facing the Federal Circuit in the next 10 years. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy the conference and have a good day. Good morning, my name is John Whalen. I'm the solicitor of the Patent and Trademark Office and I'm honored uh, to be the moderator on this morning's panel. And uh, to get started, uh, I'm gonna make the introductions brief. I think you know uh, by name or by face uh, most of my panelists. Uh, starting to my left, uh, Kent Jordan. Judge Jordan is the district judge in the District of Delaware. And he's been there for about four years and sees, uh, for some reason, Delaware seems to be a place where a lot of patent cases get filed and his familiarity with patent law has probably increased exponentially in the last four or five years. Uh, prior to that, uh, he worked in private practice. He was an assistant U.S. attorney and uh, clerked on that court. Uh, to his left is Tom Hunger. Uh, Tom, I was looking at his bio, has uh, been the deputy solicitor general since 2003. And Tom and I were commenting that it seems a lot longer than that, given the number of cases he and I have worked on uh, in the last three years. Uh, and I mean that in a good way. Um, there are four deputies, as I understand it, three, three uh, uh, career and uh, one political, and the careers two civil and one criminal. And Tom is one of the civil deputies, and they divide up the jurisdiction. And uh, amongst the jurisdictions that Tom supervises are um, uh, patents, copyrights, trademarks, uh, international trade, government contracts. So most, most if not all of the Federal Circuit cases uh, that the Supreme Court has interest in, Tom will be supervising uh, those cases. Uh, to his left is Seth Waxman, who was the Solicitor General uh, from 97 to 2001. Um, he 
has argued uh, almost four dozen cases before the Supreme Court. He's now becoming a more frequent uh, advocate at the Federal Circuit. He's argued a case against our office, uh, uh, PTO, about a year ago. And he recently argued just the eBay case, which came down a few days ago. Um, I missed saying this. Tom argued two cases this year involving the Federal Circuit. Uh, both the independent in case, uh, which came down, and the LabCorp case, which is still pending. And last but not least is Chris Eukins. Um, Chris is a professor at GW, and his expertise is in government contracts law, procurement. He follows that docket of the Federal Circuit and the Court of Federal Claims. Um, he has clerked at the Second Circuit and uh, has uh, a JD out of University of Virginia. He also worked at the Justice Department in this area of the law before. So with those introductions, just to let you know how I'm going to run this uh, or how I envision it, I want it to be more of a discussion than a lecture. Um, we'll go for about 50 minutes. We have about an hour. And then in the last 10 minutes, there should be mics set up if you want to congregate to uh, ask a question. We'll take a few questions at the end. When I was preparing this uh, outline to talk about some of the issues that this, the Federal Circuit is facing in the next five or 10 years, um, before I get to that, I was going to ask the panelists whether or not they thought the, federal, the Supreme Court was getting more interested in the Federal Circuit's jurisdiction. And sitting here today, I think that's a stupid question to ask. Uh, <laughs> so given that it seems to be, at least statistically, um, I'd like the panelists to independently comment on what they think. Uh, do they think it's a good thing? Why do they think it's happening? And I think, Tom, if you want to start, I think you have some statistics of uh, the Supreme Court's interest. And just to be clear, the, there are two ways the Supreme Court gets interested, and Tom will explain this. One is by taking a case like eBay, and another is by inviting the SG's views, and the latter has really increased in the last four or five years. So Tom, you want to start? Sure. Thanks, John. We uh, looked at the patent cases that the uh, Supreme Court has handled since the formation of the Federal Circuit in 1982, and uh, as uh, every patent lawyer, I'm sure, already knows. Um, during the, the until the last couple of years, the rate at which the Supreme Court considered patent cases on the merits was was something less than one per year, and there were plenty of years when they had none at all. Uh, in the last uh, last term, they had one patent case. This term, they had three patent cases, and they've already got one for next year. So, in terms of cases that the court is considering on the merits. Uh, the rate has certainly increased. Whether that will incre uh, continue, of course, is uh, hard to say. The other category of uh, court action, Supreme Court action, that we looked at involved invitations. As John mentioned, when the court, rather than granting cert in a case, asks the Solicitor General to uh, submit the views of the United States about whether cert should be granted and about whether the decision is uh, right or wrong. And there, the pattern has been even more stark uh, in the, uh, like we looked at the past 10 years, in the early part of that period, there were no invitations in patent cases at all. Uh, uh, starting about six years ago, the rate went up to maybe uh, a couple per, per year, one or two per year on average. And in the la last year, there were four. This year, there have been five, and, and the term's not even over. So there's no question that uh, the Supreme Court is much more interested in patent cases, at least, than it was before. I don't think we've seen a similar uh, trend, though, in other areas of the Federal Circuit's docket. Do you want to explain and then Seth follow up about uh, how the invitation process works? I think um, I was not familiar with it until about 2001 and how that process worked and how the government's views are formed um, in, in such a when, when an invitation comes. Well, um, <coughs> the invitation process is sort of an anomaly, and I must say that um, I myself had never heard of the invitation process until I uh, spent my year in 1995 and 96 as the principal deputy SG. I came to the office, and you know, after about a couple of weeks in the office, we got this order from the Supreme Court. It's just a simple order. It says the solicitor gives the case name and style and says, the Solicitor General is invited to express the views of the United States. And I sort of looked at this, and, and I actually said to Ed Needler, who was the, one of the career deputies, I said, this is an, it says order, but it also says we're invited. 
perhaps, and I don't want to touch this issue, perhaps we could just RSVP regrets. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Explained that, you know, there were certain proprieties to be observed, and uh, the operative word on the page was not invitation, the operative word on the page was order, and uh, the only good thing that could be said about it is, is that these CVSGs, and call, calling for the views of the Solicitor General, is the one thing as to which the Supreme Court rules don't apply a time deadline. And not yet, right. <laughs> and so the Solicitor General's office can take a, what was historically a relaxed view to uh, filing a response to these invitations. But basically what they are is they are a reflection of the fact that, uh, that the United States government is the most frequent litigant before the court, that the Solicitor General is a statutory officer of the court, and the United States is a party uh, in a very significant number of the cases before the court, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of petitions filed every year in cases that don't involve the United States, even though they, as a party, even though they may involve important federal programs um, or very important federal regulatory statutes that where the dispute arises in a, in a, in a private litigation context. And by long tradition, the Solicitor General has only very rarely filed an amicus, an uninvited amicus brief in the Supreme Court at the petition stage. That is, by statute, the Solicitor General is allowed as a matter of right to file an amicus brief in any case without consent. But the practice has been to file those briefs at the merit stage, that is, after the Supreme Court has decided to take a case and not while the court is deciding whether or not to exercise its discretionary jurisdiction, the thought being that if the court wants the views of the United States on how it should exercise its discretion, it will ask. And that's what an invitation is. The invitations will come in in a case in which the government is not a party, but some federal statute or important federal program is at stake. And one or more justices says, why don't we hear from the Solicitor General about the views of the United States on whether this is an appropriate case for us to consider this statute. And there are usually, I don't know, between a dozen and two dozen invitations a year. And because the Supreme Court has had this practice with the SG for many years, the SG in all but maybe one case a year at most won't file an amicus brief at the petition stage without an invitation. Right, and what the people should understand is when, as Seth said and Tom referred to, it's the views of the United States government. It's not the PTO's views, it is not the antitrust division's views, and there is a big United States government. And there are meetings and, you know, obviously certain agencies and parts of DOJ will be more interested in one case than the other, and that I think works quite well. Um, but it is a collective viewpoint, and the process iterates through, and a recommendation is made uh, as to whether to take or not take the case. And to take, usually a recommendation is then made as to what the outline of the merits brief would look like. And so it's a it's an interesting process. And all, as Seth said, that this is a common practice of the S Supreme Court, but in the area of especially patent law, since about 2000 or 2001, this has become it was never. I, from 95 to 2000, I'd never experienced it, and now it's routine. Uh, I mean, now it's two or three cases a year. They're two this summer. So, uh, Judge Jordan, do you think you practice, you see cases, you were an assistant U.S. attorney in different areas of the law. Do you think the Supreme Court's involvement, uh, increased involvement uh, and interest in this area of, of jurisdiction is a good thing, and why? And uh, I, d I do think it's a good thing for at least a couple of reasons. One is, um, it's an acknowledgment of what uh, I think everybody in this room already believes, and that's that the uh, intellectual property docket of the Federal Circuit is a matter of tremendous national importance. And uh, the Supreme Court taking an interest in that at a greater level uh, affirms that uh, in, uh, in a pretty dramatic way. Um, the, the other reason I think it's uh, a good thing, probably, is because it 
provides a dialogue about substantive patent law that uh, probably wouldn't exist otherwise, unlike the, the regional courts of appeals, which have the benefit of having their uh, sister courts tell them, hey, you were wrong about that, or we read your opinion on this, and we don't think you got it right, or uh, maybe you should be thinking about this other thing as they bat issues back and forth. There's not really the same opportunity to do that with a court of national jurisdiction as the federal circuit is. And so uh, there's a greater chance to have uh, the law develop through dialogue with, uh, with other jurists by having the federal uh, circuit decisions reviewed by the Supreme Court and having some uh, uh, law developing that uh, then can come back to the federal circuit and, and through those iterations you get a, uh, I think, helpful precedent. And Chris, do you think the Supreme Court, you think the area of the law that you practice in would benefit by a little more, uh, or let me back up, um, what is, what has been traditionally the Supreme Court's interest in the area of government contracts and uh, if there's one area of law that you think that they should visit, which what would that be? So the, the, uh, the sad joke among government contracts lawyers is the Supreme Court sort of tuned out in government contracts somewhere around 1950. Um, if you that, that used to be the joke amongst the patent bar too, but <laughs> things change. So <laughs> the, I, I, it was an interesting question that you posed, John. So I actually went back and looked at the last 10 years of cases in the Supreme Court involving government contracts, and most of the cases, in fact, have arisen outside of the federal circuit. Uh, the Supreme Court has, has reached in uh, with regards to social and political issues involving government contracts. Uh, ten years ago, ironically, ten years ago, the Supreme Court said that as a matter of First Amendment law, it was inappropriate for governments to discriminate against contractors based upon their political speech. Um, many of you may have seen news reports over the last week that uh, Secretary uh, Jackson made a speech in Texas saying that it was okay for him to exclude a contractor uh, because of that, that contractor had spoken out against President Bush. So it's interesting 10 years later to, to see that arise again. Um, the, 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 this Justice Scalia, uh, a few years ago, entered a spirited, a spirited dissent in a case where the Supreme Court had denied cert uh, regarding race-based contracting. So that's an area that's likely to arise again. Um, and it's an area, that's an issue that may well come up to the federal circuit. Um, the Supreme Court has weighed in on the boundaries of Congress's power in, in the Windstar case and the case recently regarding uh, False Claims Act uh, suits brought against the states, um, but that is not an area that's, that's unique to the Federal Circuit. Um, last year's decision, Cherokee Nation, uh, was actually split in the circuits and then involved in one of the cases came up to the Federal Circuit, but again, wasn't something unique to the Federal Circuit. Um, a, the one area that was truly important, not a social or political issue, but one area that's truly important to the procurement community is the area of generally contract formation, how competition, how integrity be maintained in contract formation. And the one case over the last 10 years that came up to the Supreme Court was a case involving uh, the National Parks concessions. And the question presented was whether or not the National Parks concession should be treated as a, con as a contract under the Contract Disputes Act. That is a very important issue because it opens up issues, opens up questions of whether or not those concessions have to be properly competed. It's an area, for instance, where we have a sharp divide between us and, and how the Europeans handle the same types of questions. So very important legal question, and the Supreme Court punted. Uh, they, uh, Justice Thomas uh, uh, rid, got rid of the case on rightness grounds. The only, the only real dissent or, or acrimony within the court was whether or not there was a standing question. But the uh, Supreme Court just completely punted on the, on the one important so, you know, people ask me why is the Supreme Court more interested, and I don't think there's a single answer. Um, I think, you know, the area of the law is more important, where it's more service economy, there are bigger dollars at stake. Um, I think they like it. You know, you look at the cases they're taking, a lot of them, injunctions, declaratory judgment. I mean, these aren't unique to patent law. These are major doctrines, and they're going to say whether or not they should apply, how they should apply in some of these areas. Um, I think there are other things going on. I think that when a court doesn't dabble in an area of law for probably 10 or 20 years, they decide to. I don't think probably that's so strange. I've heard they've done that in any trust from time to time. They get in, they get out. Um, the Supreme Court law clerks now can take patent classes at, at the top law schools and you know, are probably taught by some of the uh, 24 law professors, which is a new business, to write amicus briefs uh, 
be, be before the uh, Supreme Court. The law professors now are writing briefs saying you should take this case or not take this case. And and just you know, if you watched the arguments this year, you have this you have the Supreme Court bar being participants. You have them. They know how to write these briefs. And uh, so you add all this up, and uh, I think it's not surprising. So. But we're here at the Federal Circuit Judicial Conference, not the Supreme Courts, and, and, and so the next question to me is, well, are there, you know, this is going to happen, but is too much of a good thing can get out of control, and would it benefit the uh, Federal Circuit uh, to maybe sit on bonk? Uh, do they sit on bonk often enough? Should they sit on bonk a little more often? Are there ways for some of these issues to be, uh, percolated internally, because the one point I'll make before I ask the questions to the panelists is, if you look at the cases that the Supreme Court is now taking, they're taking straight panel decisions. KSR, uh, they haven't taken it yet, but they're interested in the case. That was a, an unpublished decision. They just asked the government's views in a case that was a Rule 36 um, case. So you're not getting the festo-type majority dissents, and what's happening is people are teeing up issues almost they, they preserve it for waiver, but then they tee it up to the Supreme Court by saying the Federal Circuit's test is wrong. They're not so much t asking the Federal Circuit to take the test on bonk, because they probably think they won't do that. They argue the facts, they preserve the argument, and then they tee it up. And so you don't even have the Federal Circuit decision sometimes discussing why there is a test. And often they're teeing up issues that were decided two or three years ago. Metamune, it's basically teeing up gene probe. You know, there are cases that were decided four or five years ago that they're now just applying. So to start, I think Tom has some statistics about uh, the en banc uh, rate of the Federal Circuit compared to uh, other circuits, and then I'd like the panelists to chime in as to whether or not you think uh, the Federal Circuit uh, would benefit by sitting on banc more and how they should do that. Uh, again, we looked at statistics uh, comparing the rate at which the Federal Circuit grants petitions for rehearing on banc and other circuits do that, looking back over the past five years to the extent we were able to get data. And with the help of the uh, library and the clerk's office here at the Federal Circuit, we were able to get that data for the, for the Federal Circuit. Some of the other circuits were a little less accommodating. But uh, in, uh, to the extent we could uh, compile the data, uh, somewhat to my surprise at least, based uh, on anecdotal reports and views that the Federal Circuit has a very low rate of en banc review, the Federal Circuit actually was third highest among the circuits in terms of the rate at which it grants uh, petitions for rehearing, just as a straight percentage of those. Obviously, it's not a very high percentage. Uh, it was about 3% for the Federal Circuit, which is about half the rate of the Tenth Circuit, which had the highest rate in the nation, uh, but is considerably higher than uh, most of the other circuits, some of whom are well below 1%. Um, and so uh, it, it can't be said that the Federal Circuit is, uh, is in any way uh, slack or behind, its, uh, uh, behind the, the, its colleagues on, in other circuits in terms of the rate at which it grants rehearing, although I suppose an argument could be made that the Federal Circuit, because it does have so many areas of unique jurisdiction, uh, might, it would be appropriate for the Federal Circuit to have a higher rate of en banc review because uh, to a much greater extent than other circuits, it is, the, it is often the final word in a particular area of law, again, unless the Supreme Court decides to take, uh, to take some interest. Seth, uh, do you think there's an area of law, or what do, you, what do you think about the, the numbers, and then would there be some issues that you would recommend that they should think about taking? I mean, I, um, I think that practitioners that, you know, express opinions to, to circuits about how they should handle their en banc petitions, you know, ought to take, you know, several deep swallows of cod liver oil first. <laughs> I mean, it's an, an, I don't have to tell the judges on the, on the court what an enormous drain of resources it is to take these cases en banc. Now, you can argue that the Federal Circuit, it is relatively less onerous because you all are coming to work in the same building every day anyway. It's a lot harder for more regionally diverse circuits like the Ninth Circuit to go on bonk, even their panel on bonks are very, very unwieldy. But, you know, we heard from the chief judge about the state of the docket here and the level of complexity in these patent cases is pretty severe. And, 
it is a serious commitment of time. It's a serious reallocation of finite judicial resources to say, you know, we've got to go on bonk more often. The one thing I think that the circuit should not do is make decisions about it's on bonk practice because, you know, oh my God, the Supreme Court is, you know, is reviewing all of our decisions. We must be doing something wrong in the sense that, you know, they're the last word and they get to say what's right and what's wrong. I don't, I mean, I, this harkens a little bit back to the earlier topic, but it's such a, you know, what's happened, the Supreme Court's relationship to the federal circuit has been such a striking, has, has undergone such a striking change that, you know, it's like the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Um, when I went to work in the SG's office, I spent a year as the, as the career, as the uh, political deputy, and then I became SG. And when I became SG, it was really my first involvement with the federal circuit. I, in, in private practice, I hadn't done patent litigation or government contracts or veterans' appeals, and I sort of knew about the federal circuit. I remember when it was created. It seemed like a great idea, but I'd never been before the circuit or in any of the tribunals that it reviews. And when I was the political deputy, I didn't really have any cases in the federal circuit either. When I became SG, we had a couple of cases that came up where there was a recommendation that we petition for cert. And Larry Wallace, who was the senior political deputy and who had handled many of the intellectual property cases, you know, said, forget it, the Supreme Court, they're just totally uninterested. They're only interested in circuit splits. There never are circuit splits. You know, the last time they took one of these cases was Chakrabarty. It was 15 years ago. We told them not to take it. They took it. We told them to rule one way. They ruled the other way. <laughs> this is just, you know. The biotech industry is happy with that. I said the, doc the biotech people here are happy with that. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> in any event, he said, look, you know, forget it. These recommendations that we petition is just a complete waste of time. And I was sort of new to this, and I looked at these, and I said, these decisions, I have to say, are not only contrary to the interests of the United States government, in my view, they're just crazy. <laughs> and we ought to ask the Supreme Court to take these cases. So we did petition in two cases. They granted both of them. They reversed both of them. And I remember Larry came into my office afterwards and he said, you have, I hope you're happy with yourself. You have unleashed something terrible. <laughs> Uh, so I forgot to add you to the causes for I why this is happening. That's, you know, I don't think, A, that's true, and B, that it's necessarily a bad thing. The fact of the matter is that the specialized jurisdiction of this court, government contracts and particular patents, is increasingly becoming, are increasingly becoming the, some of the predominant issues in American jurisprudence. I mean, we don't make anything in this country except intellectual property. It is just a reality that this court's patent docket is going to, is of much greater national importance. Just look at the debate in Congress over, this never-ending debate in Congress over how the patent laws that for the most part have been reasonably intact, at least since 1952, ought to be readjusted in light of the realities of biotech and software and methods patents and things like that and you know this re-exam process and I think that the, the court's grant of, of jurisdiction in an increasing number of cases of this circuit is not a reflection of the fact that the circuit is somehow falling down or deciding things the wrong way it's that the subject matter that this circuit deals with is of greatly increasing importance to the national economy and there aren't circuit splits. They're looking for error correction more with respect to federal circuit cases than they are with respect to the rest of the country because it's not a sufficient answer in federal circuit cases to say to the Supreme Court, you're not in the business of error correction. You know, if the lower federal courts have worked out a uniform regime way in which they answer a particular question, Congress is unhappy, it can change it, otherwise our work is done. I think they do view themselves as being in the business of error correction in, in this area, and that's just, that's a fact of life. And I think if you take, we, we could, we don't have time, but I think you could take five or seven areas of the law where the Supreme Court just hasn't talked about it in 25 years where the Federal Circuit has to have evolved the law because of the technology or uh, applying it in 
their 400 cases a year or their, I'm sorry, 1,500 cases, but let's say 400 patent cases or the 2,500 district court cases. They need rules. They need tests to apply. And if you were to compare a federal a Supreme Court, let's say, that spoke on it 25, 30 years ago and the federal circuit application of it today, they might not perfectly line up. And so Tom and I were talking that maybe it is a good thing for the Supreme Court to say, is this the right evolution? And yes, no. Uh, if it is, great. If it's not, tweak it and move on to the next issue. I, I just remember, th it, um, Judge Friedman will probably personally remember this, but there was a period in which, I think in, in the 60s and 70s, in which the Supreme Court increasingly took more and more federal tax cases, so many that the Solicitor General created a special position called tax assistant, um, which was paid more than all the other assistance. Um, Tom, you want to create a patent assistant? No. Probably because I think we, there still is a patent <laughs> No, not, we got not anymore. We got rid of them. Anyway, they, 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 <laughs> they, every year they seem to take more and more tax cases, and every, with every grant, the tax bar and the tax court shuddered audibly because there was this sense among tax practitioners that every, almost every time the Supreme Court issued a decision, it a, made no sense to anybody who actually practiced in the area, and B, caused an immense amount of confusion in both, on both the Hill and in tax litigation and for tax planners. And I mean, I'm not a patent lawyer, but I hear a fair amount of the same reaction now. You know, when the Supreme Court granted, you know, Metamune and posed its own question, I had people coming in and calling me saying, I don't even understand this question. The metabolite, the metabolite case, right? You, you said metamune, which is a different case. The metabolite case. Yes, the metabolite, right. And the metabolite, what does this mean? How could anybody who understands patent law have actually asked this question? And my response is, they don't necessarily have to understand <laughs> patent law. And maybe the Supreme Court's review of the work of a specialized court is a way of intermediating between specialists and the general legal public how to apply, enunciate, and understand these doctrines. So the, the, the current trend may be horrifying to people who actually specialize in the area, but it's a fact of life, and we need to grin and bear it. And I certainly don't think that the Federal Circuit ought to change its en banc practice in reaction to a perception that, well, you know, if we don't get our act together and speak with one voice, the Supreme Court is going to review all of our cases. Although, if I could just add, I think I, I agree with Seth. I, I think if you look at the cases that the court has been taking, um, a number of them f seem to fall into a category of cases in which a, a, a specialized rule seems to have been uh, f formulated in the patent context that to a generalist uh, Supreme Court, it looks different than the rule that applies in, in, in other areas of the law to the same sort of question. If, for instance, the eBay case, the, at least the petitioner's argument in that case was that the Federal Circuit had a special rule for injunction, injunctive relief in the patent area that was different than the rule else, uh, elsewhere. Or in the uh, Independent Inc. case, the argument was that the courts were applying, not just the Federal Circuit, but all the courts were applying uh, a presumption of market power with respect to patents that wasn't applicable in other tying cases. And so, and the same argument could be made with respect to the Metamune case where the question is what's the standard for uh, declaratory relief in a patent case uh, as opposed to other cases or at least in certain kinds of patent cases. So it, to, to some extent, the Supreme Court taking the generalist approach that Seth mentioned may be asking itself whether it makes sense where there's a question that applies not just to patent cases, but more generally, whether it makes sense to have the rule be different in the patent context. And that's a question, obviously, that, that to the extent it applies in other areas may be asked by, by practitioners uh, before the Federal Circuit also. Now, Judge Jordan, um, the Federal Circuit is, you know, I think is pretty good in, you know, they're pretty active in the bar events and they listen to the criticisms and I think especially from uh, the district court judges uh, in particular. I think when the bar is criticizing, they listen, but the bar is always criticizing. And, but, you know, I think Phillips was an example where the dictionaries, uh, I'd heard a number of district court judges uh, say, you know, we're not sure what to do. And, and they, they took it up and I thought wrote a fairly uh, uh, 
you know, really a, kind of reset the clock and let some everybody you know have a case that they can all work from. But if there was another area, uh, an issue that you would recommend that they consider visiting in the next year or two, what would that be? Um, well, I you know that's <laughs> that question makes me uh, uh, think about my my wife's slightly modified uh, Churchill uh, remark she threw at me, which was, uh, you ought to be more modest because you have so much to be modest about. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it takes a lot of nerve to come in here and tell people, you know, this is what you ought to be thinking about. But, um, thinking about the, uh, the title of this session, which is uh, most important issues facing the court over the next 10 years, uh, from a perhaps parochial perspective of a district court judge, I don't think there's any more important question than uh, the question that the court didn't answer in Phillips. You know, I was on the edge of my seat. Oh, what's question seven going to look like when we're done with it? Uh, the one about deference to district court decisions. And uh, I, was I was disappointed <laughs> that uh, the decision was to put that off for another day because I think systemically there is no more significant issue uh, facing the, uh, at least the intellectual property piece of the Federal Circuit's docket, then how do you uh, review the district court decisions uh, with an appropriate level of deference? Um, I'm sure there's, you know, much brighter people than I am who have uh, uh, better informed views. From my perspective, though, uh, it, it hasn't been gotten right yet. It needs another look, it, and uh, Cyborg is, uh, I guess, eight going on ten years old now, uh, and the debate that was sparked in that decision uh, has not, I don't think, been adequately resolved. These cases, as Judge, Chief Judge Michel mentioned today, these Federal Circuit cases are very complex cases, and if they look complex on appeal, you know, <laughs> I'd suggest that people come on and see what it's like uh, day to day, because when you're dealing with these uh, at the trial level, there are, it seems like, thousands of decisions to make. Every point is argued. There's so much money at stake, and there are so many lawyers on these cases. I mean, platoons of lawyers just to show up in the courtroom. And that's to say nothing about the minions back in the office who are <laughs> researching and pounding away and coming up with, you know, well, did you think about throwing this issue at that? One time I came in. Honest, no exaggeration. They had created for me the pretrial order, which, with the appendices stacked up taller than me, and I'm over six feet. And I came in and I said to him, "You can't have meant this for me. I know that. There's no way that you did this for my benefit. The only explanation for this work product, since I'm, I refuse to believe you did it, just for the sake of the enormous billable hours it had to go into it." <laughs> The only explanation for this is you're looking past me, which the way review occurs today only makes sense from your perspective. However, I need something I can work with. So take this back and give me something I can work with. But, you know, it is entirely rational for practitioners to litigate not with an eye on the district court the way they do in every other kind of case that comes before me, but with an eye over my uh, shoulder, it creates inefficiencies, it creates significant problems. And I think I can appreciate some of the frustration that the, the Federal Circuit might have, it, it's like the old Calvin and Hobbes cartoon where you, the mother yells, uh, what did I just tell you? And uh, Calvin says, what, you weren't listening either? And <laughs> And the, you know, I, I get a little bit of the sense of that when I read Federal Circuit cases sometimes. Like, I, we told you this before, don't you get it? Uh, on the other hand, you know, from the district court perspective, it's like the old saying that madness takes a toll. Please have exact change. And you have people who are <laughs> looking over your shoulder saying, you know, you didn't do that exactly right. Well, in the madness that goes on at the district court level, sometimes you can't get the change just exact. You got to do the best you can, and we need to work on that deference issue. Uh, I think that's maybe the most important issue 
uh, for the court to deal with on an on-bank basis. And I remember a, a chief judge in the district court commenting once, uh, I think he's a very, I think you know him referred to, he's a good, very good judge, and he said, oh, I make errors all the time in the courtroom. And uh, he goes, I make five or 10 a, a, a day. He goes, it's just a question of whether they're reversible errors or not. You know, you're calling balls and strikes and you have to make decisions. And by having the deference issue, uh, you know, so low on the claim construction, you're basically just encouraging appeals. You're not encouraging settlement. Uh, and, you know, I clerked, now I feel old, about 15 years ago, and we had claim construction issues in cases, but not every case. And we actually had trials, and uh, there wasn't, maybe there would be one word being debated. And now, if you look at Texas Digital, there were 10, there were 10 different uh, phrases being debated uh, on appeal hoping to get one right, and so it's just gonna create that yep. level of, uh, as you said, kind of looking past you. But Chris, if you could answer this question and then dovetail into the next. Um, one is, if you had to pick, if the Federal Circuit was listening and you could give them one uh, issue, just like at the Supreme Court, would it be the same one that they should uh, consider, or is there an issue they could should consider uh, at, at taking on Bank in your area? And secondly, we talked, I thought it was pretty interesting about amicus, how, the amicus type of support in your area seemed to be a little different than just writing a brief explaining the law. You talked, when we, we discussed this in prepping, some of the uh, uh, numerical information or the real life information in, in your area of practice, if you could touch on those two points. Right, I, and first I, I joined Seth in saying that if, if you're choosing the most important areas in, in, in my particular topic, government contracts, looking up the hill, looking to what the Supreme Court is doing, for the reasons I discussed before, would be exactly wrong. You have to, the, 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 the search has to be elsewhere. I think, and this is really important, I think the Federal Circuit has to decide with regards to government contracts what role it's gonna play. Uh, there are two basic models I see for the Federal Circuit. The Federal Circuit can either be like the, 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 circuit, the circuit judges originally in the United States, available for dispute resolution on an ad hoc basis, and we'll call this an appellate review uh, in, in the government contract sphere. That could be the possible role for the Federal Circuit. I would argue the Federal Circuit to take, should take a much more serious role. I, I would argue that if you think about it in terms of a, of a pyramid, there are approximately, if you think about the federal procurement regime, there are over 100,000 people, at least, doing federal procurement in this, in this regulatory regime. And that regulatory regime is worth probably close to $400 billion a year right now. It's a very, very important part of what we do. The important thing to understand about that regime it is, is that it's vitally important to the strength of the nation. I mean, we had, and it, it's one where we compete directly with other, na other nations. Uh, a partner of Seth's from Seth's Berlin office came and joined a colloquium of ours. We talked about what we call IDIQ contracting. Natalie Lubin came over and she talked about what she's doing. She's doing in Germany exactly the same things that we're doing here. These are procurement systems around the world and some hostile procurement systems that are moving exactly in parallel with us. Now I can estimate that we're about five to 15 years ahead of most procurement systems. And I can get into technical details and explain to you why that's it's such an important advance or such, a, it's such an important edge to have in terms of how good, for instance, our weapon systems are. You, know, you can take my word for it. Our procurement system is more sophisticated, and as a result, our ability to defend the nation is much stronger, and we can, we can buy better products for the United States. Now, if the Federal Circuit's gonna play a role in that procurement regime, that procurement regulatory regime, it's gonna, and it really is at the top, it plays a role in guiding that procurement <coughs> regime. And if the Federal Circuit sees its role in that sense, then it can begin identifying which issues, for instance, should go on, bot, on bunk. If you look where all the ferment is in the law, it's not on the contracts administration side. That's why the Supreme Court tuned out in the 1950s, because the contracts administration law is really pretty mature. The ferment is all on the contract formation side. So where the, the, the Federal Circuit might focus its intention would be on issues of contract formation. And this is where we get to the amicus issue, because the tragedy is that these formations issues come up to the Federal Circuit through bid protests that don't really look that important. They are vitally important because if we mess up on contract formation issues, what the United States buys for the procurement system won't be as good. And that can affect, I mean, that can affect, you know, how, how good the armor is that kids are wearing as they go into battle in Iraq. It's very, very important stuff. So I would encourage the court to look, at, if they're gonna reach out to use the amicus process, to use it on those cases that seem least important, the cases that involve contract formation, because those really are vitally important. 
And it was encouraging to hear uh, Judge Lynn's comments that as the federal circuit becomes more electronic, um, uh, as basically the, the whole brief set is going to be up on the uh, uh, web page, uh, uh, it'll be easier to at least follow the cases. Um, I, I watched a panel about a year ago with Chief Judge Michel, and part of the problem with amicus participation is just finding out about the case. I mean, um, uh, I don't want a thousand letters, but we, the government participated in the Voda case, uh, and somebody sent me a letter uh, on the district court decision, and that the federal circuit had agreed to take it up in lock, and it's not my decision, and I'm going to segue into this question in a second, but I at least knew about it. And you have to do it so early on in the process, because you have to get interest, in, whether it's bar associations or the government, you have to get sign off. But, um, you know, uh, to at least be able to know about the case and the right case, you know, whether it's, whether the word baffle means baffle or doesn't mean baffle, or maybe that's not a good example because that was an important case. Not for that, not for that reason, but, but, you know, when it's a question of law, when it's a real legal issue, a statutory issue, you know, that is at least worth uh, letting people know about. And, um, but I'd like uh, Seth and Tom to just comment about how people ask, people will ask me, uh, well, how come you didn't file an amicus brief at the Federal Circuit? And it's not that simple. We have a lot of independent authority as a, as a, um, uh, in the, in the cases that come out of the PTO, but in an interlock, in a, in an interparties case that we're not a party to, it, there's a lot of work that goes into whether you're going to participate as an amicus. And if Tom and Seth, based on your experience, want to comment as to how that process works and, and what's required. Sure. In the, in the patent area and generally uh, with respect to amicus filings in the courts of appeals, the Solicitor General has to approve uh, the filing uh, by a government agency, and that applies to the Patent Office and other agencies with interest in matters before the Federal Circuit for the most part, although there are a few exceptions, um, like the International Trade Commission, for example. Uh, and when an amicus request comes in, for instance, if uh, the PTO were requested to file an amicus brief, they will prepare a recommendation memo that analyzes the issue and the, and the case and the proposed approach and submit it to the Solicitor General's office. Uh, one or more other components of the Justice Department that are interested in the particular issue, typically for Federal Circuit cases, that would be the Civil Division, uh, the Commercial Branch, the IP staff, or the, or the litigators who handle government contracts. They would be involved. The C Civil Division's appellate staff would be involved, potentially other interested components of the, of the Justice Department, for instance, the Antitrust Division, if it's a, if it's a patent case of interest to them. Other agencies within the government, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, HHS, uh, a wide uh, array of different agencies potentially, dep depending on the particular issue, well, all of those agencies and components will prepare their own recommendations, analyses. We will typically uh, frequently meet with the parties, one or more, one or, or either uh, of the parties that uh, are interested in the government either filing or not filing an amicus brief or in what it might say. And so it's a very time consuming process. Uh, which is why John says that uh, he can't just file an amicus brief in any case that, that might come to the office's attention. And also, I'm sure John would like me to, to make clear that, that uh, for patent lawyers, you can't blame John if what we say in the brief <laughs> isn't what, uh, what you think we should have said. Or give me credit. Um, there is, uh, the process is really, anybody that thinks we write these briefs is, is, is wrong. I mean, the, um, I, I actually think the process works very well. I mean, I think we try to teach them the area of the law or the tax people teach you the area of the law or the environmental people do. And then it, it, it's kind of like teaching the Supreme Court. They're not experts, but they all learn it and they learn it very, very well. And it, it is a collective process and I think it produces a good work product and it seems to be followed at least uh, with some, some frequency by the Supreme Court. Um, Seth, do you want to add Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, um, I mean, I think that the requirement that all amicus briefs filed by any agency of the United States be authorized by the Solicitor General and reflect the views of the United States, not a particular regulatory agency, is a very, very useful requirement that has stood both the United States government and the courts in very good stead. It's a 
we don't have time to go into it today, but there's a sort of a long, interesting history involving the Supreme Court uh, in the 19th century that led to the creation of the position of the Solicitor General and reflected a great dissatisfaction and frustration in the courts, and particularly the Supreme Court, with the United, the lawyer representing government interests, speaking, you know, articulating different interests and different interpretations of a statute and different meanings of federal law depending on whatever it took to win a particular case. And the notion that the United States ought to try and speak with one voice in any court on the same legal issue and come up with the same consensus answer is one that greatly enhances the stability of the law and aids federal judges, both district judges and court of appeals judges, in saying, okay, well, I've got a government lawyer here and who's telling me that the position of the United States on the question of whether there is a written description requirement that's independent of enablement <laughs> is X. And we're not going to be told something else by some other lawyer in some other case. We may or may not agree with them, but now we know what the institutional interests of the United States are is a very good process. There are some instances of courts other than the Supreme Court. I've talked about the, the invitation process. There are a couple of other courts that on occasion do request the views of the United States, and the Second Circuit has certainly done it, and uh, the judges in the Southern District of New York are sometimes do it. In fact, to the great frustration of the Attorney General, they frequently call the State Department and ask the legal advisor. Just call them up on the phone. <laughs> provides for some interesting interagency discussions about who will speak. Uh, uh, but, you know, I don't think that, I mean, I think that if the Federal Circuit or a judge in the Federal Circuit were to say, this is a really important question, the government is not a party, and I, I would like the views of the United States on this, I request the views of the United States, I would think, I mean, the Justice Department certainly wouldn't want to encourage a profligate use of that practice. And it might take us a while to respond. <laughs> but, you know, there are instances in which it really is, it really could be quite consequential. And I, I think that, I think that courts ought to, ought to request those views if they think, if, you know, if a panel or the circuit thinks that it would be useful. I've been uh, permitted to go a few minutes over since we start a little late. If people want to line up and ask questions, I'm going to ask one more question that's going to be very fast, a five second answer and then if people want to ask their own questions, we'll open it up. Does anybody on the panel, um, and I don't want to put Tom in a spot, speak on behalf of the United States government, but think that giving the Federal Circuit 10,000 immigration appeals a year uh, to its current docket is a good idea? Hearing silence, I will move on. <laughs> It's a good thing that Judge Jordan is not a Third Circuit judge, because he might think it was a good idea then. But uh, um, um, I cannot see the mics. I apologize. My eyesight's not great. And talk about talk about a deer in the headlights. It literally is big headlights. Uh, so if the mics are, if somebody could raise their hand and ask a question, if somebody's I hear it, I'll be able to repeat it. I'm sorry, you see it. Somebody's raising their hand. If somebody wants to stand and. A lot of question. I'll repeat it for the audience. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. Anybody have a question? It's a friendly bunch. So no questions? I can't tell. Well, I will ask. I have a, I have a question that you won't ask. Okay. Institutionally, but I wonder whether the other panelists think what deference, if any, the other panelists think the circuit ought to give to the PTO. Yeah, that's a dangerous question for me to ask, but since you asked it. Look, I'm a private practitioner. I'm not a patent lawyer. I didn't tell him to ask it. Having worked for the United States, the, the issue of deference to federal agencies and federal expertise is is one that it's a very it requires a very complicated calculus in answering it. I guess I don't get to ask you the question. You can ask Tom the question. <laughs> um, the, federal government, the federal government is certainly 
fond of arguing for deference to agencies, <laughs> and um, uh, this, I can't claim to have studied this particular question closely. My understanding is that the Federal Circuit uh, does not, at least for the most part, defer to the Patent Office's interpretations of substantive patent law, although it does defer to uh, interpretations of procedural matters and, and of Patent Office regulations and the like. Uh, which, which is an interesting phenomenon because uh, in most areas where there's a federal regulatory agency with expertise, the, the courts do give deference. In the patent area, uh, if an examiner issues a patent by statute, that patent is presumed valid and the federal circuit has held that, that clear and convincing evidence is required to overcome that presumption of validity. So. So the, the decision of a, of a particular examiner by statute receives a form of, of de deference, at least on factual matters. Uh, so certainly an argument could be made that it would be appropriate to defer to patent office interpretations of substantive law, assuming one could ascertain the, the correct expression to which deference might be due, which is a little complicated in the, in the, pat in the patent office area because there are both guidelines that the office issues, and then there are also decisions of the administrative tribunal, the Board of Patent Appeals. Um, so that may be one of the, uh, one of the issues that, that may be coming up at some point uh, in the future in the Federal Circuit. Okay, does anybody else have a question they want to ask or anything else they want to add? Question? question? Or make a comment. Um, I did argue a, a case at the Federal Circuit this last year. And it had to do with how much deference should be paid to the patent office. And I had a, a question on written description in a biotech case. And I contacted the solicitor's office, patent office, and I asked, uh, well, you know, maybe we could work together on this. We think we need a change in the written description for proteins. Could we work together on going to the Fed Circuit on this? And they said, no, this is an adversarial process. What do you mean? You want to work together on something? And my opinion is that if you're going to give deference to an agency, then the question becomes, is that agency really dedicated to winning the case as an adversary, or are they interested in getting the proper result that should be gotten by the agency? So when you get into the substantive law, I think it's very important that the court, the Fed, Federal Circuit, take a look at that. Well, um, I don't recall a case. Um, it's a specific case. I'm happy to talk to you after the meeting, uh, after we're done in a minute. Um, because if it was an inter-parties case and it was an amicus request, I don't recall anybody asking my opinion or, um, and I think it would have been brought to my attention. That's but as, as to your second point, um, I, I think people that practice in front of our office regularly, at least I would disagree, my, our job is not to win every single case. I mean, the job of the patent office is to issue good patents. And there are probably, out of the 50 or so cases we get a year, probably one or two that probably should issue or there should be some sort of settlement. And uh, we do that routinely. Uh, we scrub every case to make sure we should defend them. And then in the one or two rare cases where, and sometimes it's a compromise in the middle, uh, we will discuss with people. So That does raise a question, though, John, about, uh, which goes back to the amicus issue. And that is, you know, because the Federal Circuit's jurisdiction is national and the docket is specialized, I don't think it's, uh, it's particularly helpful to look at, well, it's not unhelpful, but it's not as meaningful to look at what other circuits are doing because you can see that uh, everything that the court does has a national impact and cases in other areas which might percolate up in different venues aren't going to do that. This is the venue where the issue is going to be addressed. Uh, so one might expect to see, if it's possible, uh, amicus folks trying to weigh in, weigh in more often because they feel like they've really got something at right. stake. And this might be the right one case is going to one, case, one case is going to affect everybody. Yeah, it reminds me of this is a, a true story. Uh, some friends were house sitting and. The husband was trying to shut down the lights at night, and he went to one of those one of those uh, knobs where the, you know, he thought he was turning down the lights or turn off, but he noticed the light wasn't doing anything. But every time he turned the knob, 
uh, the, the dog started to bark. So he called his wife and he said, hey, this is amazing, listen to this. And she hit his hand and said, you, you dope, that's the power for the invisible fence. And <laughs> you had the, the poor dog, <laughs> as this guy was winding it up and winding it down. And I think that there's, you know, some of that that might happen unintentionally as, as people focus on one particular case and they adjust the knob, not reeling that, realizing that there's a party over there who's feeling the power on the fence go up and, and experiencing the pain. And, uh, I, you know, so uh, amicus in the federal circuit, I think you could even expect it to be more common. That's not a bad thing. Right, because if you're in the ninth circuit and a copyright case, you know, you can always go to the second circuit right. or the fourth circuit and you really don't, one decision on one case and uh, can then bind everybody else subsequently. Well, I want to uh, thank the panel and uh, give them a hand for their excellent participation. <laughs> and the, the, the program shows there's about a 10 or 15 minute break while they reset the dais. Thank you. This Federal Circuit Court of Appeals Judicial Conference continues. In this session,